All right, here we are. Week two, day two. This is South Park and Society, Cine 399. It's the real Dr. Dre, aka DJ Food Stamp, coming to you direct. I'd like to say live and direct, but direct from the barn uh, here at the, at the homestead. I'm on the second floor, chilling. Uh, you can see I got a little organ, an Art Deco radio. I got to get down off the wall. They came with the building. You can't see my hoop. My basketball hoop that also came here, which was like the main selling point for me. Um, so we'd be balling uh, in, the, in the barn. But uh, anyways, you're here. I'm here. I don't even know what day it is, what date it is, what time of the day it is. Like I've lost all concept of time. It's brilliant. I, I love it. But uh, anyways, today we have two topics. We're going to talk about intertextuality in South Park. And we're also going to uh, address uh, small town stereotypes. Um, in the show, okay? So uh, you've probably heard the term intertextuality. You've probably used it. You maybe heard it in an academic setting. We're gonna kind of put it to, put it to uh, you know, analysis in the context of South Park. Uh, I'd ask you to watch, um, Simpsons uh, already did it, uh, which, you know, which is again, I think believe season six. Another episode that's very self-reflexive uh, for Matt and Trey. Um, where they're, you know, they're talking about the fact that they have run out of ideas, which is something that's come up many times in many seasons, and you can see it in some seasons more, more than others. Uh, but they're, you know, they're given the gift of society and stupidity um, enough where, you know, there's plenty of ideas, you know, plenty of material for them, source material for them. Um, but check out what I found in the barn. Look at this. Here at the homestead, we got that high test, crazy TP. This is that next level shit nobody got. This is exclusive as hell. Fifty dollars a sheet, premium ply. It's like one tenth ply tracing paper, just like everything else he makes. High quality tracing paper TP. Very exclusive here at the homestead. You know where you can get a square if you're in deep need. Right here. Um, anyways. Back to intertextuality. <laughs> uh, the last couple classes we talked about uh, Bakhtin and his theory of the carnivalesque. He had another idea, a literary idea called heteroglossia. This was a basic, basic, basic notion that, um, you know, that uh, texts themselves, right? Cartoons, books, movies, music, video games, you know, basically anything, um, you know, uh, that like they were connected to the past, you know, in some way. And there was a web of meaning that created the meaning and you, and you had to understand a little bit of, of, the, of the past and the, the, the text that came um, before. So the present discourse, right, the, the meaning we ascribe to people, events, things, concepts, ideas, um, et cetera, um, you know, all come from this web of texts, you know. And so Julia Kristeva, who's like this, you know, pretty important literary scholar, um, if you ever try to read her actual books, good fucking luck, that shit is like mind-numbingly academic um, to the nth pain, painful degree. Um, but I think the important thing, you know, is that she took heterogosia, this, this concept that there's a web of texts, right? And she kind of really applied it to modern literature in the 70s, 80s, et cetera. And she also established, and this also came from Bakhtin, this, this concept that everything is dialogic, that, um, you know, meaning was not fixed and that there was a constant dialogue with the text. So like, when you watch an episode of South Park or I watch an episode of South Park or whatever, like we're going to get different meanings out of it. We're going to come to different conclusions. We're going to think um, different things. And this is going to be based upon, you know, our identity, our positionality in the world, how we read text, and also our familiarity with the web of text that preexisted. So I'm asking you to watch some, you know, uh, older episodes of South Park that came out when you were like four or three or before you even born. Um, and so it's harder for you to make socially 
you know, a social context around that because you, you maybe have been, were, were pretty young um, at the time. So the way that you interpret those episodes is different than like where like an older head like myself would, would, in, would interpret them. And that means that like that, that the story itself is dialogic in that you're interpreting what they write based upon your own position and your own understanding of the web of text that, that pre-existed it. That's sort of the, 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 the idea here. So Chris Deva kind of said like reading, which is the act of making meaning. It's not actually reading words or watching something. It's consuming a text and then making some sense of meaning out of it um, is mediated by like these codes that we get from, from other texts. And again, um, what that means is when you read or watch something, it's encoded with a certain meaning, meaning the author, the author, quote unquote author, um, wrote it with a certain intention. And then we decode it, right? And in that process of us reading it and us making sense out of it, we're decoding it. And maybe we agree with what, you know, we, we read it in the same way they intended. We read it in the antithesis of that or we sort of negotiate it. We're kind of in, in the middle where we're, we're making our own meaning, but we're kind of latching on to what the authors have said. And in this sense, you know, there is no author like we are the author because we're making meaning. We're reading it, you know, in a very specific way. OK, and, and this is really important that the, like the meaning doesn't come from the author, the quote unquote author. The meaning comes from our reading of what the author intended in, in, in the text. And this, again, has to do with this whole web of what we've consumed um, in the past, amongst other things, our family background, our religious, our religious background, um, you know, our race and sexuality, um, our gender, etc., informs how we read and decode um, text. And in this sense, we're an author. In this sense, we're in dialogue with text. It's not a, a monologue, right? And that this meaning is produced through a whole group of, of texts that we read and that we connect. When we watch an episode of South Park, we connect it to things that pre-existed it, that it's, that it's referencing, okay? Um, and so that's just a very important thing. Is like we're not, we cannot be separated. Us humans you know, us subjects cannot be separated from the text that we consume. Um, and that's a very important, important part that that narrative is dialogic. So the story and what the story means is in a dialogue with what we have in here and what we've experienced and consumed in the past. So that's kind of like, you know, you could read a chapter or a book by Chris Tabor or a journal article and have your fucking head explode. Or you could have me kind of crap it out and like, two minutes. I crapped it out. So I already asked you to watch Simpsons already did it. This is like an immense, like, um, you know, intertextual episode. I mean, it's so patently intertextual. Um, and it even references intertextuality. The fact that, you know, Butters, uh, you know, uh, is unfamiliar with, you know, these episodes of the Simpsons, you know, that like he, he goes into this mental craze where everything, you know, he comes up with for, for sinister ideas, um, have already been done by the Simpsons, you know, and, um, you know, Professor Chaos just can't reel it in, you know, and, um, it's so, it's just incredibly intertextual in that, in that sense, um, that, you know, it does require the, like not only for us, you know, in the process, but for Butters, you know, Professor Chaos in the profit process to have an understanding of The Simpsons. And I think, you know, it's very important that, you know, um, you know, Matt and Trey and, uh, I mean, you know, and uh, Matt Groening from The Simpsons, like they have a really tight relationship. Like they really respect um, one another and the art and the cartoons that they make. And so, so there's a very important part of like, um, you know, there's a little bit of honor in, in when they do that versus like when they did Cartoon Wars where they lampoon um, uh, Family Guy and the creators of Family Guy. So, um, you know, there's, there's just so much, you know, so much in this. All the characters turn into Simpsons looking characters. They reference Simpsons, um, you know, lines. Um, don't have a cow man, you know, from Bart, etc. 
and he goes into this like world of, of The Simpsons, and it's, it's really a comment on originality, what is originality, and the fact that South Park really struggles sometimes to come up with an original idea, and maybe sometimes there isn't such a thing. I mean, that's kind of the moral at the end, is like, yeah, fucking nothing's original. Um, it's all built on the past, you know, and that kind of brings in like the theory of intertextuality by Kristeva. Um, it also, you know, brings up this concept, you know, of us like constantly being influenced when we create, whether we're creating plans of chaos or we're creating, you know, text, text, uh, texts for classes or, or, or whatever. Um, you know, we have, uh, you know, quite a few moments of parody um, and satire in, in, in this film, um, although less, less parody of um, the Simpsons. They're not making fun of the Simpsons. They're honoring it, right? They're, they're, they're honoring it. And um, I think that's, that's sort of important here. But um, yeah, it's a whole episode on intertextuality, which I just think is just, is just pretty interesting. And South Park itself, if we go through the chapter, which we will, you know, is super intertextual. But um, I mean, you've had other instances where all the characters like Bart and Milhouse, um, you know, show up to the bus, the bus stop um, in a Simpsons episode, you know, and they look like the South Park boys, you know, like uh, Kenny and, and Cartman, et cetera. Um, you know, so they've, they've, they've incorporated South Park into the Simpsons in some instances. Um, they've even shown, uh, you know, uh, South Park on TV in the Simpsons too, like they're watching it. So there's a little bit of, you know, playful, playfulness between um, the shows and the creators who have a lot of adoration for one another. So we want to think about types of intertextuality. Um, you know, uh, it's really, if you want to think about what it is, it's a way of linking text. It's a way of connecting um, this, this web, connecting the dots, uh, so to speak. And the way that we see it in South Park, um, in, in so many ways, are you know, are often in parody, right? But like, like intertextuality is a huge part of South Park, and we'll kind of go through this. So first off is parody. Uh, you know, I've talked about this, but this is just directly making fun of someone or something. And it's patently obvious that you're referencing them in order to destroy them, to, you know, undermine their authority, to disrespect them, to show them as, you know, pieces of shit. Uh, so, so, so to speak, right? It's a mocking process. So parody is very important. So pay attention to that when we watch, when we watch episodes. The other element, and this is what we probably saw in The Simpsons, um, already did it, is pastiche. Pastiche is when, again, you directly mimic um, a, an object or a subject or a text in itself, and it's a form of celebration. It's a form of honoring. And so, I mean, I think that's a major part. I mean, here The Simpsons have been on... 30 years almost, I think fifth grade, <laughs> 1991, I think is when it came out for me. I'm just you know, referencing my, my web of texts. Um, uh, but you know, like, uh, you know, how do they stay on the air that long and keep, you know, a show rocking, you know, and rolling? Um, I think that's really, really like a major uh, feet and so the South Park lads celebrate that in so in so many ways, but they have a lot of respect for one another. So it's not to make fun of the Simpsons. They don't say the Simpsons are unoriginal. They say everything is unoriginal, and that's sort of the moral in that story. The last um, uh, element of intertextuality is what's called allusion. This is more of like an indirect reference. Um, it could be quoting. Um, you know, a famous movie line or something, something like that. It could be like a, a subtle, subtle reference to something um, in South Park. Um, it's just not completely direct. Like they don't, it's not so obvious. It requires you, 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 as the reader or consumer to have, you know, a pretty decent amount of knowledge, um, you know, to make those connections. And that may just go over your head because maybe you don't you don't get that that reference because um, it's not as direct as pastiche or as as um, parody okay so we'll try to try to pay attention to those things when you watch episodes elements of parody pastiche and illusion okay so here's the deal 
you know, um, South Park makes a lot of references in every show and usually to film, okay? Usually to film, usually to television. They're constantly making references to movies. I mean, there's no doubt that the lads are big movie and TV um, fans. I mean, there's no doubt about that. So there's always going to be a few references, right, of, or moments of intertextuality in an episode of South Park, okay? It's intertextual in a different way in the sense of they borrow so many conventions from film and television, uh, specifically things like um, they use flashbacks often. They use, um, you know, the element of, of montage, so cutting things together to create meaning. So the way that they edit and cut, um, you know, clips together in South Park are maybe not a linear narrative, but it's more of like, you know, see image B next to image C and you get meaning X, you know, is kind of the, the concept. They also use things like laugh tracks and concepts like that. So some of these like conventions that you see, um, you know, in film and in, in television, some of the aesthetic conventions, um, they will often parody like filmic technique um, or genre. So like you'll see movie uh, episodes of the, Sim uh, of the Simpsons of South Park, you know, that are more horror film styled or love uh, romantic comedy rom-com style. Um, they'll use, you know, again, specific editing techniques, pans. They'll use, um, you know, uh, uh, specific music, uh, music techniques, you know, uh, soundtrack stuff. I mean, just kind of everything like that you will see, like will in a film will kind of come into South Park in some form, form or fashion. So, um, you know, again, like flashbacks, montages, um, you know, they'll, they'll allude to certain films, um, certain film genres, etc. Okay. Uh, and I think this is patently obvious that South Park very often directly and indirectly references other t TV shows and other films. I mean, it's just part of almost every episode. So it does require the, the reader or the consumer to have a little bit of knowledge of, you know, movies and TV. Um, and that requires us to be what, you know, what the author calls televisually literate. That for us to really make sense out of South Park, to really kind of see Matt and Trey and the rest of the writers um, and animators and the creative teams like intention, like we have to really have a pretty good understanding of the history of film and, and TV um, and sort of the breadth of content there. And there's a little image of the Prophet Muhammad greeting um, uh, family guy Peter um, with his ball chin. Um, again, uh, a censored part that we'll get to when we talk about censorship in South Park. Um, but I like, to, I like to show those scenes um, that have been censored or episodes that have been censored. Um, but you have all other types of intertextuality, specifically with TV shows. So if you think of um, you know, the South Park and if, you know, child abduction um, is not funny, right? The use of the news. I mean, the news is such a vital part of South Park, such an incredibly vital part of the story and the narrative. That's a huge intertextual, intertextual moment. Um, in earlier seasons, you have Jesus and Pals, which is a TV show. Obviously, Terrence and Philip, um, which is a major, major part, again, um, alluding to uh, you know, a very famous um, cartoon show that's watched on The Simpsons. We can nudge if you know what I mean. Um, and then um, uh, Ned uh, had hunting and killing, which, you know, again, so lots of original content that appear on, on the show itself. Okay, so that's, that's intertextuality in South Park, just to give you sort of feel of it, give you a little groove of it. I think it's something just to pay pay attention to when you watch episodes specifically over the next few days, few weeks. I may ask you to think about that. I may ask you to, um, you know, to think about references in films or references in South Park and be like, is this parody, pastiche, or illusion? So be kind of familiar with that um, as, we, as we move forward. So we'll take a little break, you know, chill out for a moment, and then we'll get into some small town stereotype action.